أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه So uh, it is my pleasure to uh, host today our brother Hisham Mahmoud uh, Hisham Mahmoud and I go a long time uh, I think we met 1992-93 ish 93 uh, 93 yeah. uh, I have a special uh, your relationship with Hisham as um, very few could say that they made Hajj together with him. Actually, he was my roommate um, uh, in Hajj 1996. Alhamdulillah, Omar was in that same delegation, but he was with the Miskin people in the tents. Um, we were the VIP. <laughs> um, uh, Hisham, uh, I remember being in, uh, in, in sitting in front of the Kaaba and asking you where the where the Qibla was. <laughs> Inshallah. Um, Hisham Mahmoud uh, uh, have gone a long way since we um, were working together in the uh, uh, Washington Muslim Society of Washington and uh, the MSA at Howard University. Um, Hisham Mahmoud has studied the theology and hadith and legal theory, jurisprudence, ethics, Quran, recitation, and Arabic with scholars in uh, Morocco, Mauritania, Egypt. Uh, Hisham has taught more than a decade in at Yale, um, Princeton, and Harvard. Um, and uh, he um, uh, recently uh, started the uh, Laturna. And hopefully he'll tell us a, a word about it uh, toward the end of his talk, inshallah. I've uh, just posted the, a, a link to uh, the site for uh, Lanturna. Uh, this is uh, an exciting summer program that uh, Haji Sham is uh, uh, running there. Uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, share with us some do it. So, uh... Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala man wala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in his majestic book, Ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaytan al-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ya ayu al-lazina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-lazina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. O you who are possessed of faith, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who preceded you in order that you may have taqwa. And this is a verse that you have heard every single Juma throughout Ramadan, every single Ramadan, and it's a verse that you're going to hear, for, hear about tonight as well. But we are going to take a, an approach that is more uh, linguistic than anything else. I want to look at this verse and I want to consider this verse with respect to the linguistic implications of the words that are mentioned in this verse and the rights of these words over us uh, being uh, being that we have uh, ascribed ourselves to this religion we, pre we we have accepted islam as our faith we we uh, we are engaged in this fasting and one should say that before before we get into that that there is a uh, direct relationship a correlation between the arabic language and the guidance of the prophet muhammad sallallahu there is the in in studying the Arabic language, one is uh, one one is overwhelmed at just how um, just how profound the etymology of the roots of the Arabic words are, and what they have to tell us about reality as we experience it and as it exists and as it is. Uh, so the subject of today's talk is the metaphysical. The, 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 the uh, uh, etymological metaphysics of fasting. And that means there's a, there's a claim there in that title that, that the Arabic words have to explain so much to us about reality as it is. And you will find that this correlates and it corresponds to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in his book and to what the Prophet sallallahu has brought. And you will see this as we go through some of the examples. And so I want to take a look at this verse in terms of some of the, 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 the words that, that impact and influence how we are to experience fasting uh, throughout the month of Ramadan. And so going one by one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. And that's the first word I want to look at is amanu. Kutiba, and that's the second word, kutiba. Alaykum siyam, and that's the third word, siyam. Kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun. And that's the fourth, fourth word, taqwa. So these four words, iman, kitab, siyam, and taqwa. And I want to look at these four words and, and, and analyze them with respect to what our tradition has to tell us about the significance of fasting and see how they are mirrored in just the, the etymology of these words. And so the first of these is Iman. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. O you who have ascribed to faith. O you are possessed of faith. And the word Iman is a little bit deeper than just faith because faith would uh, imply uh, tenets in which we believe. Uh, these are doctrines, uh, the, the creed of a person. That's all there connected to faith, belief and conviction. Right? These are some of the words that come to mind when we think of the word faith. But iman is a little bit different. Iman is a, a transitive word that takes a direct object, Right, that there's a certain direct object. When you say amana, you have a direct object with that. And amn is related to that. And so what is the direct object of iman? It comes down to amina. Amina means to secure, right? to secure, to uh, render something safe, to safeguard something. And that's amn. Amn is security, right? And that comes from the same word. Amana is a trust that you protect. Right? And that you render back to the, to the person who entrusted you with it, you render it back to him safeguarded. And so when we talk about Iman, what we are guarding is the intellect. The intellect is the direct object of Amina, right? So a person who, uh, who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguards his intellect from false belief, from false doctrine, from blasphemy, from heresy, from ideology, these things that will, uh, that will, um, that will, um, that will totally uh, pollute a person's beliefs in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Messenger of Allah. So Iman is literally what we believe about Allah and what we disbelieve about Allah. What are those things that we believe about Allah and what are those things that we reject that, 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 are, that are claimed about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a son, right? We reject that. These are, these are, these are the, and by our rejection of that, we render our intellect safe and secure and, uh, and, and safeguarded. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing those who have iman, those who want to uh, safeguard their intellects, those who want to safeguard themselves and be literally on the safe side, right? Kutiba alaykum as And then kutiba is an interesting word because it literally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said wujiba alaykum as or furida alaykum as that fasting has been obliged upon you, fasting has been uh, mandated upon you. But he literally said fasting has been written upon you. It has been prescribed to you, prescribed. And that prescription, that prescription, that language that we use, you know, when, when a person goes to a doctor and he, and, 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 and he comes home, his, his wife or his husband or her husband, uh, she'll say, Mada kataplak, right? Mada kataplak, right? What, what, did, what, did, uh, what did he write for you? What did he prescribe for you? Literally, what did he write? So fasting was written as a prescription. It was a prescription, right? That fasting, that by, by saying, kutiba alaykum siyam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing this in the language of its being a prescription. And one of the things about prescriptions is that prescriptions are written for people who have maladies, for people who have ailments, physical health, ailments, right? That we have, we have a certain ailment and we go to a doctor and he prescribes a medicine. So by saying that fasting has been prescribed, then fasting is being described as a medicine to heal certain spiritual maladies, right? And when you, when, by healing them, the, the, the soul becomes then healthy again and fortified and secure and sound. And so we have this flow through, the, the, through this one verse of a, rest, a restoration of health, a restoration of spiritual health 
by the prescription of fasting. And so fasting is not just skipping meals. Fasting is not just going without water. Fasting is, is, to, to, uh, is meant to heal us of certain spiritual maladies. And it's written as a prescription that will get us out of our anger and out of our rage and out of our uh, arrogance and out of our, our the, the, all these idiosyncrasies that, idiosyncrasies that we have, all these spiritual maladies that we have collected throughout the past year. Fasting is meant to heal us from that and to purge us from that and to restore our spiritual health. For that reason, it was a medicine prescribed. Uh, and even the word prescription, right? You have the word scribe, right? A, 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 a Something that is prescribed to us. The scribe is the one who prescribes, right? The scribe. So it's literally, it's, it's in the English language as well that it's written, that there's something that's written for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it uh, and decreed, uh, decreed it for us to be able to, uh, to, to, to have these healthy, healthy hearts by the end of the month, inshallah. So that's the, that's the second word I really wanted to focus on, is there that, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word kutiba, right? Where he could have used another word. And then he says, kutiba alaykum as-siyam. Kutiba alaykum as-siyam. And siyam is a very beautiful word in the Arabic language. Siyam is a beautiful word. And it comes from three letters, sama yasumu, sad, wow, meme. Sama yasumu, salman. And the Arabs use this word in a very, in, in very beautiful context. Uh, and be, before the Prophet ﷺ even was born, right? The, the way that the Arabs would use the word sama is uh, it, 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 you can take from it spiritual metaphors for how we are to engage and experience our fasting in the month of Ramadan and fasting in general. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, 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 the Arabs would use this word sama in, in three or four different contexts that I think are really informative for our experience of the fasting. They would say, for example, sama uh, tarih, right? Sama tarih. When do you think, and I'd like for you to answer the question either in the chat or you can, you can you know, when do you think that the, that the wind is fasting? Because they would say sama tarih, the wind fasted. When do you think the wind would be described as fasting? Samat al So go ahead and chat away. That we can make this. Even though I can't see most of you, you can you can all uh, you can all chat there. Exactly, Dr. Nordin says when it, when there's no when when the wind is not you, there's no blowing of the wind. There's no, there, you can't hear the leaves and the trees um, uh, bustling, right? There's no blowing of the wind. When the wind is utterly still, right? right? When the wind is utterly still, i.e. when there is no trace of the wind whatsoever. There is no trace of the wind. Then the wind is said to be fasting, right? It's fasting. And for the faithful, as he fasts, when there is no trace of the ego, then you have truly attained to that level of the fast, like the wind, right? If you can be like the wind, and literally, if you can be gone with the wind, right? Gone with the wind. That's the idea of Samatariya. When you are gone with the wind, there is no trace of you, just like there's no trace of the wind. There's no trace of your ego, just like there's no trace of the wind. This is where the Prophet ﷺ, he describes this as saying that if someone comes to you, um, uh, and tries to provoke you into an argument, right? If someone tries to provoke you and to push your buttons, basically the response, and if you're fasting, the response is to say what? Inni sa'imun, inni sa'imun. And the scholar said that, that the first time could be for yourself and the second time for, 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 the, for, for, the, for the person, or the first time for the person and the second time for yourself or both times for the person, or both times for yourself, right? So who is the one who, whom are you addressing in that? In Isa'imun, in Isa'imun, you could be addressing yourself both times, like, hold on to it, just just, just hold on, this will pass, this will pass, right? Just trying to, to calm yourself down, or just to inform the other person, I'm not interested, like, in Isa'im, in Isa'im, you're telling the person emphatically, just, uh, I'm not interested in going there, right? Uh, and so, 
this is interesting. It's an interesting response. The Prophet said, if, a, if someone comes to provoke you or to argue with you, the, re the response, the proper response is, I'm fasting, which doesn't make any sense. That, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I didn't, try to, I didn't try to offer you a snicker bar. I'm just asking. I'm not trying to get you to eat a snicker bar here. I'm just trying to get you to, I'm just trying to get you to, 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 to um, you know, you just have to, you just have to prove to me why the Democrats are, are, are better suited for this position than the Republicans or whatever they're talking about, right? Whatever they're trying to get you to argue about. And your response to them is, I'm fasting? <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't like, but it makes total sense if you understand the meaning of sama yasumu, right? Sama yasumu sama. If you understand the meaning of this being a pillar of this religion, um, and we'll get to that inshallah. But basically, just on the linguistic level, you are gone with the wind. And if the Prophet the Prophet is uh, prescribing us to say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, what this literally means is that you, you have, there is no trace of the ego that can be triggered while fasting. That's, that's like, that's like a, a, a station, a spiritual station of the fast, that if you're truly fasting, then there is no trace of the ego that can be triggered or provoked while fasting. There are no buttons to push, right? There are no buttons to push. And here, this is, this, you know, a lot of times, you know, if a person is fasting, the, especially in the first, in the beginning of the month, uh, of, of, the, of the fasting month, you know, you might be on edge. You might be a little bit on edge. Your temper might be, uh, uh, your, your, your fuse might be a little shorter and your temper might be a little quicker to trigger, right? But a person who is truly experiencing this level of the fast, the fasting with the wind, there is no fuse. There is no fuse. You put it out, right? There's no fire. You put it out with water. There's no, there's no point. There's no button to press. You know, you can't, you can't push on my buttons because there are no buttons to press. So to push, they're all out of order. All these buttons are out of order. They, they don't work. They don't work anymore, right? And I, you know, I, I there, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, uh, not to not to embarrass anyone, but there is uh, there's someone on this in, in this group here um, taught me a very important lesson that whenever someone pushes your buttons or provokes you, there was something that that uh, that this person used to do. They used to wear a rubber band on their wrist, right? And they would just remove it from one wrist and put it on the other wrist, and that's how they just allow that to dissipate. They allowed it to just you know, uh, ease itself away. And then, and then if the provocation came again, or if the test or the, the, the tribulation came again, they just remove it from that, from, from that wrist and put it back on the first wrist. That's how the, it shall all pass. Everything shall pass, right? And so this is the idea that there's no trace of the ego that can be triggered in Ramadan because I'm fasting and I'm gone with the wind. Just like the wind, I'm gone with the wind. Right, and the Arabs used to say, "Samat the Jaja," or "Samat." No, well, before that, they, they they would say "Samal Khayl," right? "Samal Khayl," because this is connected to the wind. "Samal Khayl." Uh, so the horse fasted. When do you think the horse would be said to be fasting? Go right to your keyboards. Right to your keyboard. When do you think the horse is said to be fasting? No, no saddle. Oh, when there's no saddle, there's no there's no saddle. Uh, okay, very good, very good. When before a race, uh, when it is calm or still, this is exactly when the horse is fasting. When when there's when the horse is not jumping up and down, prodding about. When it's not eating its hay. When it's not bolting back and forth. It's not like it's at a complete standstill is at a complete standstill. And that word standstill is a very important word in English because it's exactly what the word means, sam al khayl. It means, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's um, synonymous with qam al khayl. Sam al khayl and qam al khayl. They would, they would use these interchangeably. 
common chayil is when the horse stands. It's just it's just standing, but it's not moving about. It's not. It's just standing. And sama and chayil, they would use that interchangeably. And sama and qama come together in Ramadan. Sama nahari naharahu wa qama leilahu. Right, that he fasted during his during the day and he was standing still. He was at a standstill during the night. Right, because this is the this is the twofold purpose of Ramadan is to fast during the day, in order to stand in the night. Right, and in fact, the two the, the real barakah of Ramadan is in the nights of Ramadan, during the during our standing at Tarawih, our standing in our prayer before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because this is where the nights host the Quran, the recitation of the Quran, and so the the fasting throughout the day is meant to serve the night. And in fact, the two meals that we have at the beginning and the end of the day, those two meals are now purposed. There's, a, there's an intention behind those two meals. The suhoor is meant to fortify ourselves to be able to endure the fast. And the iftar is meant in order to fortify ourselves to endure the prayer. And these are the twofold purposes of the two meals. Um, so basically, siyam is meant for qiyam. Right, our fasting is meant for our standing, and in this sense, we're just like that horse that is standing still, still in his being, still in his, you know, in in, in, in unbothered, unperturbed, and just receiving. And that is for the believer the greatest metaphor because in the prayer itself, we are totally at a standstill with our Lord. Our limbs are at a standstill. We have a tuma'nina, we have this tranquility in all of our limbs, and we are there to receive the words of our Lord. We're there to receive his words. And so just like the horse, we're not fidgety, we're not jittery, we're not uh, bolting back and forth, lashing out back and forth, we're not busy in, in eating or drinking, we're not prodding about or anything like that. We're completely at a, at a state of utter serenity, calmness, repose, and tranquility, uh, especially in the evenings when we are standing before our Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers the angels and he says, uh, and, he, and he instructs the angels to look upon us, and he says, uh, Did I not tell you that I know what you know not? And so that is when, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he boasts about us to the angels uh, in, when, when we stand in the nights of Ramadan. Um, and so that is Sam al Khayl. The Arabs also would say, Samat al-Dajaja or Samat al-Nu'ama, right? That the chicken fasted or the ostrich fasted, right? So we're, again, we're looking at this from the perspective of linguistics. Like how do the Arabs use these words and how can we glean the benefit from just the import, the linguistic import of these words uh, that will now uh, inspire uh, uh, us in our experience of the fast? And so they would say, Samat al-Dajaja, Samat al When do you think the chicken or the ostrich is fasting? Let's take this, the chicken because we've all observed chickens, right? When, when would the chicken be fasting? And we have, we have a good number of people, uh, we have a good number of people on today. It would be great to hear your guesses. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have almost 30 people who are logged on. And so it would be 36. We have 36 people logged on. Let's get a let's get a good a good number of responses here. So Hassan said, when there are no eggs to 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 you know when there are no <laughs> when there are no eggs to lay, right? Uh, when it is sitting and not moving about, no. When not moving and not making noise, right? Very good, very good. Alhamdulillah. And I see we have uh, we have uh, Zainab Barka. Now, this would be it would be wonderful to hear Zainab's guest at this as well. And Maryam is Maryam on or is just Zainab? No, she's working, saving lives. Okay, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, like her father. No, okay, not producing eggs. Very good. No movements. Very good. Very good. Alhamdulillah. So we're getting some of the same guesses here. So very good. And so if you when it, when it's resting, when it's resting, very good, Zainab. And so basically. It's, uh, it's none of these, right? Uh, the calmness and the stillness, that's with the wind and the horses. We've exhausted that meaning, and so, and so we, we're going to move to another meaning. 
And so the the uh, the chicken is said to be fasting, samat dajaja, after akramukumullah, right? After it purges itself of its impurities. When the chicken purges itself of all of its impurities, it's said to be fasting. You know? oh, finally, after pecking away at whatever chickens eat all day long, uh, once the chicken purges itself of its impurities, it is now uh, accurately described as sa'ima, right? So for the faithful, when we are fasting, our fasting is a purging of impurities. And to that, the Prophet has said, and we can see how the how what it means in the language is reflected in the prophetic guidance, right? Going back to the introduction, how, how the, the usage of these words in the language is reflected in what we have come to understand about the reality of these things in the religion itself, from Allah, from the Prophet So the Prophet to that point or to that meaning, he says, that these five prayers, one Friday to the next, one Ramadan to the next, are an expiation of everything that happens between them, as long as the major cardinal sins are avoided, right? Which means that just by virtue of fasting this Ramadan, all of the sins that we have accrued to our names and to our books from last Ramadan till this Ramadan, they are wiped out. They're, they're gone. They're wiped out. They're erased. They are gone. Just by virtue of fasting without even istighfar or tawbah, without even saying, oh Allah, forgive me for all those sins that I've done, without repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those sins that we have done, just by virtue of fasting, just by fasting this month, like you fasted last year, Ramadan, they're all forgiven automatically. Such is the compassion of our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by praying, uh, Maghrib is about to come in for us, right? Just by praying Maghrib, the sins that I have done between Asr and Maghrib, they're all wiped out without me having to ask my Lord to forgive me of those sins by virtue of my, my prayer, the next prayer, they're wiped out. The same thing with Juma, right? Such is the compassion of our Lord. And the Prophet ﷺ described the prayers. He said, he said, can you imagine someone who, who dips into the river five times a day? Do you think that he will have any trace of dirt on him or any trace of, of impurity on him after having done so? And they said, no. He said, such is the prayer, right? Such is the, that's the, that's the prayer. And so this is from the bounty of our Lord. Of course, istighfar, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and tawbah. This is all from the adab of, 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 of akunu amdan shakura, right? Shall we not be grateful servants? This is from the etiquette of a, of a, of a servant who is grateful that, they, that we will ask for forgiveness for all of our sins, whether major or minor, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will distinguish between our sins as major or minor. But we should not make those distinctions. We should not look at such and such a sin as this was, this was, this was a small thing. Uh, or, or, or because they said, do not, do not look upon the insignificance of your sin. Rather, look upon the significance of the one against whom you have sinned, right? Do not look at, do not look at, at such and such a sin and say, ah, oh, that was nothing, right? Because that is the sign of the hypocrite. The hypocrite, and this is something the first person who taught me this was Omar Ewing, who's here with us. He, he said the first, the hypocrite is the one who looks at the greatest of his sins as like they were, and this is a hadith he was teaching me. The hypocrite is the one who looks at the greatest of his sins like it was a mosquito coming to his nose that he brushes away. Oh, that was nothing. Ah, oh, God will forgive. Um, oh well, so what? Right. This is the hypocrite, but the faithful person is the one who looks at the 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 smallest of his sins, like it was a mountain getting ready to collapse upon him. Right. That's how. And so this is the sign of faith. And so even though, just by fasting this Ramadan, all of the sins that we have accrued, the minor sins that we have accrued, are forgiven. This does not mean that we don't don't 
also ask for forgiveness, that we don't engage uh, uh, our, uh, that we don't moisten our tongues with the with istighfar. For the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, used to ask forgiveness for uh, uh, for for um, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa taala at least seventy times a day throughout the day, not just not just with the uh, with the beads here, you know, not the stafalah, 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 stafalah. No, it wasn't like that. It was throughout the day. Throughout the day, the Prophet ﷺ would ask for forgiveness. For, and, and, and this is coming from a man who did not sin, <laughs> who did not willfully disobey his Lord, right? And he, and he is establishing that as, a, as, as our exemplar. The point being here that Slama, Slama the Dajaja is related to purging, of a, a purging of impurities. And for the faithful, the fasting is a purging of impurities. It's a purging of impurities. The 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 this purging and 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 it's and it's interesting that we fast the month of Ramadan, because especially now we're talking about language, right? It wasn't always called Ramadan. The, the, there was a time before the Prophet ﷺ, generations before the Prophet ﷺ, that the names of all of the months of, of the, the Arab month. Those names were all changed, and we have the months that we now have, right? And so the original name for Ramadan was Natak. And because the Arabs were following a lunar calendar, um, when, they, when they would come, w once the next month comes in, they would change the month, the name, right? They would change the name. And so when, uh, when the time for Natak came, they noticed that Natak was... Um, was it, it must have been around July or August. It must have been around July because it was the hottest month of the year. It was the hottest month of the year. And this was the month where the camels, and by the way, uh, one in every third word in the Arabic language has to do with a camel somehow. Just got to come back to a camel. So that's just one, that's just one of the principles of the Arabic language. And so they noticed that the camel's hoof was burnt, right? From, 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 from the desert sand. And so they called it Ramadan, right? That which burns, that which burns. And it was, it, it must have been around July or August that that happened, right? So literally, we are fasting in the month that burns away our sins. It literally burns our way, burns away our sins to ashes. And so this also is one of the, and like all of this is by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He chose Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that the Quran would be revealed in Ramadan, the month of burning, right? The month of burning. Because if we burn away our sins in Ramadan, then there's nothing to burn away in hellfire. If we burn away our sins in Ramadan, then hellfire has nothing to burn from us, right? We meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pure without sins to burn because we burn them away in, in, in Ramadan, right? And so the the you know Ramadan is not just meant to burn away our calories, right? By by giving up uh, breakfast and lunch, right? But it's to burn away our sins, and that is the that is the purpose of the month is to burn away our sins. Now, and so the 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 uh, and so by burning away our sins, there is a purging. And interestingly enough, the next month after that, they was the month of Wa'il. Right, wa'il, and wa'il. When that month came, they noticed that the camels, again, <laughs> the camels and the sheep and the goats, that they didn't have milk in their udders, and so they called it the month of shawal. Shala uh, yashulu means to be vacant, uh, to be emptied, to be purged, literally to be purged. And so the udders of the camels, the, the and and the udders of the the sheep and the and the goats. Uh, th th they were purged of milk. So literally, you have the month that burns away our sins, finds us the next the next month purged, completely purged with a with a new with a new uh, uh, page before us to write our deeds upon. And this page has no sins on it. There are no blemishes on this page. And so the Prophet sallallahu said that. Uh, that those who follow up, that those who fast Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, and follow it up with six days, beginning with Shawwal in the Maliki Madhab, 
or with six days of Shawwal that all have to be, be fasted within the month of Shawwal uh, in the other Madahib, then it is as though he has fasted all the, the entire year. And Imam Johari Abdul Malik, he was the first person to bring this to our attention, that doing the math of that, right, um, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Messenger said that every good deed is multiplied tenfold. Uh, and so if you do the math of that, you have 30 days of Ramadan, which are uh, 300, right? So 30 times 10, and then six days, beginning with Shawwal, right? Six days, and that's 60. 300 plus 60 is, a, is 360, which, which are more than an entire lunar year, right? That's more than an entire lunar year. The lunar year is 354 days. And so just by the multiplication, why six days? Why, why, why six days of Shawwal? Six is not, even an, it's not even an interesting number symbolically, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, there's, there's, there is yeah, sitat ayam, right? That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the heavens and the earth in six days, in six periods. Uh, but that's a, that's pretty much the only number of six where it has any significance. Other than that, you would have, you would have expected seven, right? Seven is that number, seven heavens and the seven, you know, days of the week and the seven skies and all, all of that. Anyway. But 300 plus 60 is 360. And so even the math works itself out like that. The point here, bringing it back to uh, the, the chicken, right, who fasts by, when, when, when he's purged of his impurities, you have Ramadan and Shawwal back to back, where we are completely purged of all of our sins. And we said that, that except for the cardinal sins. The cardinal sins require tawbah. They require repentance. And that's the difference between the minor sin and the major sin. The minor sin does not require repentance. There are so many different ways of expiating for those sins, uh, some of which we have just mentioned. Uh, and as the Prophet has said, just follow up any sin with a good deed and it will, it will wipe it out, right? Just by doing that. You, if you, you've done a, a you, you, you've lashed out against someone, right? Buy him a thank you card, right? Or give him a hug, right? Or, you know, or, 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 or cook them a meal and it'll wipe it out. It'll just wipe it out. That's, but major sins require repentance. Okay. And then the Arabs would say, right? the sun fasted. When do you think the sun would be characterized as such? When is the sun fasting? And let's get, we have, let's see, we still have 36 people. No one's signed off. Alhamdulillah, that's a good sign. That's a good sign that no one signed off. So at sunset, very good, very good. Um, and I want, we have 36 people. I want at least half of you to give your guesses, all right? Half of you, an eclipse, beautiful, beautiful. Kosuf, that's the eclipse, very good, beautiful. When do you think, uh, we need more guesses. That's three out of 18. We want 18 people to respond. Oh, when it's cool, okay, when it's cool. Uh, when, the, when, there's, when there's no heat, right? When there's no, like you would expect the sun to be blazing down on you, and, 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 but it's cold outside. Okay, very good guess. All right, keep them coming, keep them coming, you guys. Always, the sun is always fasting. <laughs> or the sun is at its hottest. When, it, when the sun is at its hottest, then it's fasting. Interesting, interesting. So the opposite, right? Uh, Dr. Nurdin said when it's, when, when it's at its coolest, and now we say, no, when it's at its hottest. <laughs> When it's in the middle of the sky, within the middle of the sky. All right, so Amani got it right. Amani got it right. When the sun has reached its zenith, right? The sun is climbing from the east. It climbs to the sky, right? From our vantage point, right? Of course, we're the ones who are going around the sun and the, and the earth is rotating. But, but from our vantage point, the sun is rising and we call it the sunrise, right? Although it's us turning. The sun rises, and as it's climbing through the sky, as it's climbing, when it finally hits its zenith and it hangs out for about a half an hour there, right, where there's no shadow on either side of an object, right, 
now the sun is said to be fasting. And at that point, it's actually haram for us to pray. There are three times where, where we, we are not supposed to be praying, and that's as the sun is rising, the disk of the sun, as the disk of the sun is actually rising, and as the disk of the sun is setting, and when the sun is in the middle of the sky, right? And that's and, and it's there for about 25 minutes or so. And so that is when the sun is said to be fasting, shams, when the sun literally reaches its highest point, when it reaches its pinnacle, right? And this is, this is also reflected in what we are taught about Ramadan, that for, the, for the, the month leading up to Ramadan, the companions couldn't stop talking about it, and the, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ was frequent, Allahumma balighna Ramadan, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. He didn't just say that a week before Ramadan, like in the last week of Shaban, Oh Allah, allow us to reach Ramadan, allow us to reach, extend our lives so that we may reach Ramadan. It was the highlight of the entire year. And then the, the months afterwards, they would look back at Ramadan and lament. And they would seek to bring back Ramadan by fasting. Fasting those six days, fasting Muharram, fasting Dhul Hijjah, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, fasting the days following the radiant nights. These were the days that the, this was the, the, the way that the Prophet and the companions would keep the spirit of Ramadan alive throughout the entire year, right? And, but Ramadan, though, Ramadan was the pinnacle. And how is the Prophet described? They said that the Messenger of Allah, they said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ أَجْوَدَ النَّارِ The Messenger of Allah, صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم, was the most generous of all people. And he was at his most generous in Ramadan. When Jibreel would meet him and he would recite the Quran with him. Uh, and so he was like he was like winds sent forth with their rain. Right, he was like the, the he was like the wind sent forth with the with the coolness of the breeze and also the rain because the reef brings rain, and so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam just to put this into perspective. Even before he was called to prophecy, even before Jibreel alayhi came to him, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was described as inna uh, kalla tahmil kal inna kalla tathmil Khadija, she mentions the Prophet with five virtues. She says, You uh, you maintain family ties. And you bear the burdens of other people. And you enrich those who are indigent. And you help redress the wrongs that are done to people. Um, and there's a fifth one. And you are um, hospitable to the guest, right? So if you look at these, hospitality to the guest, uh, taking upon himself the burdens of others, um, redressing the wrongs that are done to people and enriching the poor. Four out of five. The fifth one is what? Um, maintaining family ties. Four out of the five. So we're only accepting maintaining family ties. Four out of the five are rooted in generosity. They're rooted in generosity, right? That, that, that generous with his wealth and with his time and with his self by taking upon himself the burdens of others all of these if you take them back to the origin what is the virtue at the origin of, of four of those five the, the that virtue is is his generosity his generosity his generosity with his self with his wealth with his time with his with, with his energy and so that is even be, before he is called in the cave Right before Jibreel Alaihissalam even finds him in the cave, these are the shama, the first, the first list of shama that we have of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We receive them from Khadija, and throughout his time in Mecca and throughout his time in Medina, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is generous. 
so much so that the Prophet ﷺ is described as that there was not a dinar or a dirham that used to spend the night in his house. Not, not one dinar, which is a gold coin, dirham is a silver coin, not one gold or silver coin, not one dollar, not one red cent would spend the night in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And if he had any money in his pocket, he would not return home until he found someone to free himself of that burden by giving it to him. Like, in the narrations, even if night overtook him by surprise, he would not return home until he found someone to give that money to, so that he does not enter his home with money. And then sometimes he would find money there waiting for him because someone would have sent sadaqah or something like that uh, for, for, for anyone to, for the Prophet وسلم, to distribute it. And so the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was, that's how he was by default. That's just who he was. Furthermore, you would be hard pressed to find the Prophet وسلم, in a state where he is not in debt to someone. Like there's no, there's no I don't know of any period in the, in, the, in the history of the Prophet in Medina, especially in Medina, where the Prophet is actually not indebted to someone. Like you, you would be hard, hard pressed to find that he was not actually in debt to someone else. And there is never an, an occasion in his life where he actually went into debt for himself. How is that? How is it that we, we scarcely find him where he's not in debt and we never find him in debt for himself? How is that? Like you and I go into debt for the house that we, the, the, the house note that we're paying, for the car, for the education, for the furniture. We have furniture on layaway, right? We'll go into debt. We'll make monthly payments on the furniture in our house. And when is the last time that you or I went to debt for one another? But the debts of the Prophet were never for himself. They were always for his companions. And anyone who came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have this need, I have that need. If the Prophet didn't have the means, he would say, go and take it from so-and-so and tell him that I will pay him back by such and such a date. And so that's why we find the Prophet ﷺ in debt. It's in order not to turn you or me away. He would go into debt for you and me. Awesome. And this is ever since before he was a prophet. This is ever since before he knew he was a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the first commands, one of the first injunctions that he has ever received was in Surah al duha and as for the one who, who asks of you, do not repel him, do not turn him away. And so this here is teaching us that the Prophet ﷺ was that generous. So if that is how he was, if that is how he was, how exactly does he outdo himself in Ramadan? How can you, how can you outdo your like that's that's who that, how can he outdo himself? They said that he was the most generous of all people, and he was at his most generous in Ramadan. Like he would he would even outdo himself in Ramadan. And why is that? Because he's fasting the sun. He's fasting with the sun. The sun is said to be fasting when it reaches its zenith, its highest point, its pinnacle, its apex in the sky. The sun is climbing and it's climbing and it's climbing. Once it reaches its highest point, it's said to be fasting. And this is how we find the Prophet ﷺ. And they would ask him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast on Mondays and Thursdays? He said, those are the days in which my deeds are presented before Allah. And I like that my, my, my Lord finds me fasting when my deeds are presented. Right? So fasting is what gives him that, that edge, right? Even over himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is unbelievable. I mean, it's like, how, how can you even fathom that? 
how can we how can we fathom that? Sallallahu that he would be even more generous in Ramadan. I don't even know how to understand that. Yeah, you know, we don't even have examples. There's not there's not there's not even examples that we can point to. Like how how can you possibly outdo yourself if that's how generous you are by default? And so we come then to the 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 words of the Prophet about fasting itself. He said, "Asriyamu Junna, Asriyamu Junna." Fasting is a shield. Fasting is a shield. And to put it in terms of that tells us that fasting is a line of defense. It's a line of defense. Look at the language. Look at the language. We have a verse that begins with security and safety of faith. Look at the language. Pay very close attention to the language so that we know exactly what this pillar is all about. The verse itself begins, and I'm just looking at this linguistically. The verse itself begins with the language of security and safety, right? Iman, right? Amn. And then from there to kitab. And kitaba, right, is a prescription for spiritual maladies. As we said before, we're just doing a little bit of a review here. It's a prescription for spiritual maladies in order to fortify your spiritual health. So again, we have spiritual fortification by taking that medicine. Immunity, right? You get immune. You, 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 that spiritual immunity is strengthened, right? By taking the medicine of Suyam. And Siyam is being described by the Prophet وسلم, as a shield, which is a line of defense, right? Do you see how this the, the verse is just flowing here? In the same semantic field of meaning, you have four words that are all pointing to the same concept, which is protection, right? Protection. And the Prophet وسلم, describes it as Junnah, and Junnah is a shield, which means that fasting is going to fortify you against an enemy, that there is an enemy within and there is an enemy without. That fasting now is going to be that shield against the enemy. So this is war. This is war. And it's interesting how fasting itself was prescribed. This verse was actually revealed in the month of Shaban, just two weeks before Ramadan, or three weeks, I don't remember specifically, it's two or three weeks before Ramadan. It was revealed in Shaban. It was revealed in Shaban. Just two or three weeks before Ramadan. And then guess what happened two or three weeks after this verse was revealed? Two or three weeks after this verse was revealed, Ramadan came in, right? And the believers were fasting. The companions were fasting with the Prophet ﷺ. What happens three weeks into Ramadan? The Battle of Badr. So the verse was revealed. And then within a month, the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr. So you have that, that verse that comes down to say fasting is prescribed for you and, and fasting is a shield so that it fortifies them within so that they are able now to meet the enemy without, right? The enemy within is that, that ego, the evil I, right? The evil I. You know, we, we, we're talking about, you hear about the evil I all the time, right? The evil I. There's no reality to that evil I. Right, that's the talisman with the with the the that turquoise hand with the the eyeball in the middle, right? That that that's not what. No, no, we're talking about the evil eye, the evil eye, I, Hisham Mahmud, I, right? That's the evil eye. That fasting is meant to to slay, right? It's meant to slay that ego, the evil eye, and so <clears throat> we have just after the verse is revealed, obligating. Allah's Messenger and the companions to fast in Ramadan, 
Now you have the Battle of Badr, right after, right after. This was within, within this, the same span of time, the same year, the same month, right? Um, and then it's revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah. It's arranged in Surah Al-Baqarah. And right after that, about six verses later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligates jihad. He obligates the, uh, the, 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 the verse that comes down saying that fight those who fight against you and turn them out from where they turned you out because they are, are people who, uh, who are oppressors. That verse comes right after the verses on fasting in Ramadan, right? The verse that obligates the fasting of Ramadan, right after that you have the obligation of jihad. So not just in the story of the seerah, does, does the, the fighting of the external enemy follow the fighting of the internal enemy, but also in the arrangement of Surah Al-Baqarah, fasting comes right before jihad, which is incredible. It's incredible how the revelation now will follow the seerah, but also the meanings that are born in the verse itself are preparing us inwardly and outwardly to fight in war, right? Inwardly and outwardly. And so you have here... The Prophet ﷺ said that as siyamu junna, that fasting is a shield, and then kutiba alaykum as siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum kattakun. Now tells us why we are fasting, and we are fasting for not God consciousness. Taqwa is not the remembrance of God, right? It entails God consciousness, it entails the remembrance of God, it's not surrender to God. These are all ways that we have sanitized and whitewashed this word in order to make it a little bit more palatable for us. But I remember when I was growing up, and when I mean growing up, I mean growing up in the shade of these two men here who are looking at you, uh, Omar and Nuruddin. When I was growing up under their wings, I heard the word taqwa all the time. I used to hear the word taqwa all the time. Imam Siraj even put it on a map with Masjid al-Taqwa, right? Like the early 90s, the late 80s, the early 90s, we always used to hear this word. I barely hear it anymore. I don't even hear the word anymore. Taqwa, and when I hear it, I hear it completely sanitized, right? Of its, of, of its import, of, its, of, its, of, the, of its weight. I hear it as surrender or God consciousness. God consciousness is dhikr. That's a, good, that's a good translation for the word dhikr, but it's not a good translation for the word taqwa, right? It's not God consciousness. It, it, taqwa includes God consciousness. It entails it, but that's not a, a good word for that, right? And, and it's not, dhikr is not remembrance, because when did the Prophet ﷺ ever forget Allah that he had to remember him, right? Dhikr is God consciousness. It's mindfulness. It's being mindful of Allah. That's dhikr, right? But taqwa is something totally different. Right? When the man came to, to Sayyidina Umar Radranu and said, Ittaqillah, uh, and Sayyidina Umar Radranu, he, he began to weep. Why did he weep? Why do you think he wept? He didn't weep because the man was telling him, uh, have God consciousness, be conscious of Allah, be mindful of Allah. He wasn't telling him to do that. He was telling him, fear Allah, fear Allah. And this, this, is, the, this is the weight of the word, it's to, to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's not the fear of a dog that's going to bark you, that's going to bite you, or a monster, or a killer, or a murderer. Or, that's not the type of fear that we're talking about. It's the fear of falling into disgrace with Allah. It's the fear of falling into disfavor with Allah. It's the fear of, fall, of, 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 being, uh, of, of, of bringing shame upon yourself in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's that fear, right? It's the fear of having his discontent. Um, and... Ultimately, it's protection. Aqua is protection, which is interesting. Again, it's interesting. It comes from three letters. What are the three letters of taqwa? The three letters that comprise the word taqwa are wow, qaf, and ya. These are the three letters that we find the word taqwa. If you're looking at a dictionary, you'll find it under wow, qaf, and ya. And wow, qaf, and ya are the root for the word taqwa and waqaya. And a waqaya is literally protection. Waqaya means protection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhu ladina amanu, hu anfusakum wa ahnikum nara. 
O you who believe, protect yourselves and your families from the fire. The Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi and that comes from the same word, taqwa. The Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, nara, He said, have taqwa of the fire, which doesn't mean have consciousness of the fire, <laughs> be mindful of the fire. It doesn't mean that, right? It, says, be, be, uh, uh, it, it means protect yourself from the fire. Protect yourself from the fire, even if with, the, with half of a date, he said. Even if half of a date, you're going to use half a date to protect yourself. So what does that mean? What does taqwa literally mean? It means X protected himself from Y with Z. That's the meaning of taqwa, the mathematical meaning of taqwa. X protects himself from Y with Z. Protect yourselves, right? You are X. Protecting what? Yourselves, right? Protecting yourselves. So you are protecting yourselves. From what? From the fire. With what? With half a day. So it's where X protects himself from Y with Z, right? Now, the root meaning here then is protection. And Abu Huraira who described taqwa as, as walking on a, on, a, on a dark night, walking in a thorn-laden um, uh, path where you have to lift up your garments to see, to make sure that you don't step on any of the thorns. That's how he described the word taqwa. And I got that meaning from a book that I borrowed from Omar Ewing some 25 years ago that I still haven't returned. <laughs> I don't have any intention of returning it, right? And in fact, I think I saw a copy of it in your library, and so I didn't think to return it. You, you don't need it. You have your own copy. So I read that definition some 20, 25 years ago in that book, and it stuck with me, right? And that's the meaning of taqwa. That's the meaning of it, that you are protecting yourself. And so taqwa then is to protect ourselves from Allah through Allah, or from Allah by Allah. We protect ourselves from Allah by Allah. Nafirru min Allah il Allah. We flee from Allah to Allah because there's no way. There's no where are you going to flee? Like if if I like if I could possibly flee from Allah, if there was a place that I would could possibly be where I could flee from Allah, you would find me there. I wouldn't be with you today, right? You would find me in that place because that's a place that's safe. I I know that I can flee from Allah to that place. But because there's nowhere to run to, there's nowhere to hide, because Allah dominates us, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lords us supreme, right? There is nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide from Allah, except right back to Allah. We flee from him to him. And so that is taqwa, is to protect ourselves from Allah by Allah, by running right back to Allah. And the fact that the word taqwa means protection now, Waqaya is a protection. The Prophet ﷺ described fasting as, uh, you, you, we, we can see now the, the correlation, the, the relationship linguistically between all of, among all of these words in the verse. These four words in the verse, they all are, they all are feeding into one grand meaning, right? And that meaning is ultimate protection. Iman will protect our intellects, right? Uh, and and will, it will give us safety and security. Uh, kitaba, right, which is the medicine that is prescribed, it will protect our spiritual health by making us immune to certain spiritual maladies and ailments and illnesses and diseases, right? Because the heart is described as either qalb marid or qalb salim. It is either a diseased heart or it is a sound heart. And the soundness of the heart is to the extent that it is fortified against diseases. And then you have the siyam, which is a fasting, which is a junna, a shield. And all of that is la'allakum tattakun, in order that you protect yourselves, in order that you protect yourselves. And so we have this incredible, this incredible message here in this one verse where the, the meaning of protection is interwoven 
in all four of the, ver the, 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 the words that are of import in this verse that obligates us to fast. And hopefully now it's a little bit clearer how the abstinence, how our abstaining from food and drink and conjugal relations, how that feeds into taqwa, how it feeds into taqwa, pun very much intended. Um, and so when you have, um, when you have one of the definitions of taqwa, and we haven't gotten into the definitions of taqwa, we haven't actually looked at taqwa beyond just linguistics. But if you look at the 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 technical nomenclature of taqwa uh, in Jurjani and Razi, Raghi al what 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 they said about taqwa, in uh, in terms of its technical definition, one of the meanings that come up frequently is tark al kathir min al mubah. It is leaving off much of what is permissible. That is taqwa, right? Not what is impermissible. We leave off all that is impermissible and much of what is permissible. So that's exactly what we do when we fast. Eating is permissible. Drinking is permissible. Conjugal relations with our spouses, that's permissible. And so by leaving off in Ramadan what is permissible, Right? We're, leave, we're avoiding what is permissible in Ramadan. Right? That leads us to taqwa, whose definition is tark al kathir min al mubah, is leaving off much of what is permissible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then take uh, that meaning, right? That meaning and turn this into a pillar of this religion. It is a pillar without which this religion collapses. And if you think about it, this is the only pillar out of the five that is based on inaction, where all the other four pillars are based on action, right? All the other four pillars are based on action. The, the pillar of fasting is a pillar of abstinence, of inaction, that what do we do with our stomachs? Absolutely nothing. Right, <laughs> right. This is this is when we when we abstain and we refuse to we 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 disengage and we that is when this pillar becomes uh, meaningful for us and that is what that that is what makes this thing a pillar and it's interesting that that not eating or drinking for an entire month leads us to taqwa. It's just I mean the the, the connection is not obvious when we think of siyam as fasting. It's not fasting. This is not the pillar of fasting. Uh, fasting in English means um, uh, going on a diet. It means burning calories. It means, um, it means uh, uh, you know, you have your dry fast and you have your wet fast. It means intermittent fasting. That's, the, that's all of these connotations come when we think about fasting. And so when we think about, okay, fasting was prescribed in order that I may have taqwa, it's not really clear. It's not clear. What's the connection between fasting and taqwa? It's not clear. And that is because siyam is not, it's not fasting. I'm sorry. It's not fasting. It's abstinence. This is the pillar of abstinence. It's the pillar of abstaining. And in that regard, now we can say, okay, abstaining. It's much broader now. Because it's not just abstaining with, from food and drink. Uh, whoever does not leave off or abandon, forsake false speech and acting thereupon, then Allah is in no need of his leaving off food and drink. And uh, uh, Sidi Nuruddin, in his last khutbah, he talked about the levels of the fast, right? Fasting with our limbs, fasting with our hearts fasting with our minds, that now, now we're talking about the essence of the fast, which is basically not fasting at all, because you can't really fast with your eyes, but you can abstain with your eyes. You can't fast with your ears and your tongue. You can abstain with your ears and your tongue. And now it makes sense, right? So this is the month of abstinence. This is the pillar of abstinence. And when we think of Ramadan as the month of abstinence, then we are exposing our hearts to receive much more of the profound spiritual blessings of this ritual. 
uh, that is uh, known as Siyan. Uh, and with that, let us uh, bring this to an end. We just focused. I didn't really, I didn't quote hadith. I didn't quote, you know, uh, the scholars, the ulama. I didn't quote, I, I, I didn't go into any of that because I wanted you to see how the etymology of this divine language, and I believe it's divine. The etymology, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we revealed it as an Arabic recital. We revealed it as an Arabic Quran, specifically Arabic. Ability to intellect and between the revelation and between reality as it is. All of these are coming from the same source. And you can see that I didn't need to quote Quran or Hadith today. I didn't need to quote it because it's already embedded in the language itself, in the etymology of the language itself, which for me is one of the most fascinating uh, realities of this language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for his revelation. Everything else that I could have mentioned from the Hadith and from the Quran and from the uh, the sayings of the Sahaba and the sayings of the scholars and, the, and, and, and Imam al-Ghazali's book of fasting, all of that you are going to see now be a, an organic extension from everything that we just covered today just by analyzing the etymology of these four words. Uh, Sheikh Hisham, barakallahu feek, a very uh, interesting uh, presentation and different perspective on the uh, concept of fasting. Our, our previous uh, speaker uh, spoke on the um, usul tafsir, uh, the fundamentals of, uh, you know, Quranic uh, interpretation. And of course, he started by uh, tafsir al-Quran bil Quran, which is the highest level of tafsir, tafsir Quran bil Sunnah. Uh, then the Aqwal Sahaba, and he, he gave the evidence from the book and from the Sunnah that Aqwal Sahaba is also a, an important fundamental of Tafsir. But then he came to the Arabic language. Now that's my point here, is one of the five fundamentals on how you could understand the Quran. And, and um, people who read translation of the meaning of the Quran, they just read in that the translation of the meaning. Um, and um, so, so um, it, it is uh, actually an incentive for us to um, uh, look at uh, etymology of, of the wording of the Quran as another approach of the, to the tafsir. Zakallah I would say, um, I would say, I would say, to, and I have done that. Uh, and, and whenever I speak about any of the verses of the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, I have um, I have seen uh, the benefit of doing that. And uh, and I think that uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons why we don't have we have tafsir in every genre. There's tafsir in every genre, right? There's tafsir bil ishara, tafsir bil tafsir balagi, tafsir bil ra'i, tafsir bil athar, tafsir um, bil tartib, tanafib and tanafib. There's all of these different types of tafsir. But why don't we have the the etymological tafsir, right, of the Quran, like going through the Quran etymologically, like my teacher in this, um, is that um, is that this really lends itself more uh, organically to tadabbur than tafsir, to ishara than tafsir, right? And and so tafsir being a, a, a harder science, this is more on the softer side of things. And you, you can have you can have tadabbur, right? Tadabburat, but but there there may be cer certain cases where the etymology of a word just doesn't it just it just doesn't inform the meaning, um, and I have seen some dangers in this. I have seen some people go to uh, to uh, pretty ridiculous conclusions based on the etymology of words in trying to redefine some of the ahkam that have come from the verses in the Quran, right? And so I've uh, so so I think I think everything you said is 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 uh, accurate there. But I would I would uh, ask you to comment um, that uh, that really this would uh, be more in the realm of tadabbur uh, and not tafsir. 
Um, uh, which is uh, reflection, which is reflection and not commentary or exegesis. No. Uh, anybody uh, in the audience who would uh, like to ask a question or uh, make a comment, please feel free. Uh, raise your hand uh, using the reaction mode there. Um, or just type on the, uh, the chat. So you want to take this question that Sister Amani put in there? Sure, sure. Um, my question is, I deal with youth between 12 and 17. I'm talking with them about the spiritual side of being fasting, but I've noticed that they are struggling to answer the question when their friends ask, what is the point of torturing yourself by fasting? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, you know, I mean, there's, well, between 12 and 17, um, you know, the, uh, so from your perspective, what would be the best answer to approach them? The point of torturing yourself so, so fast. Basically, it's it's um, one thing about youth is that they're they're competitive. You know, they are competitive. They like a challenge, and so uh, you know, not to. I think to reframe it is important because there is no torturing of ourselves. And one one of the things that, and they're also empathetic by nature. One of the things that uh, you can say is that. It's really to uh, to gain uh, one of the benefits to be gleaned is that you gain an appreciation for people who hunger in the world and to experience what the poor are going through on a daily basis. Anyone with a conscience, uh, any student uh, between that age with a conscience will, will be able to relate to that and to appreciate that. I think that's one way of answering that question. Another is that children by nature are very competitive also, uh, some more than others. And uh, one thing to say is that it's basically a challenge. It's like a challenge uh, to uh, go the whole day without food and drink to be able to strengthen your uh, will and to strengthen your, your, um, your, uh, your, your determination. And, and by going through this exercise, you're not weak to the temptation of pizza and all of this other stuff that, you, that we're surrounded by, as, uh, especially fast food and whatnot that whenever you're hungry, you just go and eat. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's, that's just a person who's responding immediately to the, to the desire for food and drink. And so this is a way of strengthening ourselves, not torturing ourselves, that this is a way of gaining control over our, it's, it's like mind over matter. And so this might be a way that the youth might, might, um, might uh, uh, come to appreciate it and even take the challenge themselves. Right? You say, you know, if it's, it's not as hard as you think, one, but secondly, you actually feel stronger. You feel lighter on your, 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 your feet and you don't feel like you're uh, at the, uh, that you're at the behest of the call of, uh, of, of, um, of hunger and thirst. Yeah. Um, Brother Muhammad, go ahead. Yeah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi <clears throat> And thank you. Uh, um, Sheikh Hisham for this um, great journey around uh, uh, for the verses, so the, the signs of the, the words in the, in the verses of Allah. Uh, that was very great. And thank you for this great kind of insight there. Uh, just I want to extend uh, uh, the, the, the meaning or maybe kind of uh, request here if this is extension make uh, it is valid or not when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with ya ladina amanu so iman there come in as one of the big components uh, and components to be um, to be raised for people that they are aiming for the safeguard of their intellectual but also for the safeguard of their emotion because the fasting here as it's coming it doesn't challenge much the intellect as much as challenging the emotional state of practicing this, this exercise of fasting. So I would just to, to, to bring this, um, this layer or this flavor of safeguard that Iman, that uh, most of the time uh, in our scholarship and books, we refer and we lay down to or is the safeguard of, um, of the intellect. And we miss the point that there is in the Iman component as a concept, as authority of the word, as etymology in the Quran is, uh, is also safeguard of 
the emotion state of this awareness of this control this is part of your state of iman state of the peace with allah state of the peace with oneself and with your environment um and just i want just to to bring that uh, as a totem and how far it's valid in the context of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using Iman here with the word of fasting and with with the concept of the taqwa here. And thank you. Zakumla khair. Allah ibarak fiqh. Allah ibarak fiqh. Afadakum Allah. Afadakum Allah. Um, any other um, comment? I like to um, uh, also uh, give uh, Sheikh Hisham a minute to talk to us about this program um, that's on the screen. Yes, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalamu Alaikum. So I I left the academy as, uh, as Dr. Nuruddin mentioned uh, to institute an initiative called Lanterna. And uh, we have been doing retreats and seminars for the past three years, alhamdulillah. This is our summer program. Uh, we've done this for about uh, uh, four, um, uh, four times now, alhamdulillah. Uh, Tale of Two Cities, where we're going to take two weekends, uh, one in um, July and one in August. Uh, the first weekend, uh, the, the last weekend, the last two weekends of July, basically, to go through the seerah, the entire seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu There's about 40 hours of content in this, uh, and it's a, it's a, um, it's a, attended by uh, youth, it's attended by college age students, it's attended by senior citizens. I mean, we have a, a, a nice uh, demographic of, of people who, who have come. We used to do this in New Mexico in a retreat in person, uh, but uh, ever since uh, COVID, we've been doing this online. And alhamdulillah, we have some uh, honored guests who are going to be with us as well. And you can go and visit uh, lanterna.com forward slash summer. And we're also engaged if you just go to lanterna.com, you'll see some of our uh, uh, our uh, current programming as well. And we are just uh, trying to extend our family uh, here by uh, inviting you all. We do a, a nightly recitation of Surat al-Mulk as well at 9 o'clock uh, Eastern time on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, every night. And our initiative is to try to get Surat al-Mulk to a thousand homes by the end of the year. Uh, and so uh, this is our intention. We want to revive the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We meet every night at nine o'clock uh, live, and then uh, you can access the recordings later if that, that doesn't work for you. Um, and uh, we're doing that every night uh, at, uh, for, for the, uh, because the Prophet ﷺ did not sleep without reciting Surat and Munk. And he said that there were 30 verses that he wished would be in the hearts of every one of his uh, ummah. Uh, and uh, th those 30 verses are Surat and Munk. And so we do that every night. And those are some of the programs that we're doing right now. We have an ongoing Ramadan program where we went through the entire uh, book of fasting by Imam al-Ghazdali. Uh, and, uh, and, and we are still going with that program uh, at, uh, at night, uh, starting from 9 o'clock, inshallah. So you're more than welcome to join us. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Hamza, Omar's uh, son, attended some of those programs himself. And so... Alhamdulillah. You can ask Hamza what he thought about those. I uh, put the uh, website uh, on the chat. If you want to copy that, anybody who's interested, inshallah, to uh, please uh, check it out. Um, also having on the screen here uh, our next program, which is next Saturday, May 8, we have in our own Omar uh, Yewin uh, having a chat with uh, Sheikh Ala Sayyid uh, on the topic of leadership and children, why and how and the ROI. Uh, so uh, I invite all of you to uh, join us in this uh, event, inshallah. Uh, this will be uh, our uh, annual uh, Ramadan fundraising event. Um, and um, as you know, Horizon Academy uh, um, is uh, part of uh, our uh, focus and interest is to um, uh, uh, transform um, uh, ourselves uh, through uh, the work of leadership, and so we start with the children at younger age, um, and uh, and so looking for an exciting exchange. Uh, Sheikh um, Dr. Yasser Ghanam will be uh, facilitating this session uh, next week, inshallah, Saturday. It'll be at 2.30, not 3.30, at 2.30, um, uh, so it's a little earlier, immediately after door here in Calgary. Uh, 
Uh, any um, last word, uh, Sheikh Hisham? Allah is an I'm honored to be with you today, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your path. All of you in the presence of uh, Dr. Nuddin and Ustaz Omar uh, Ewing, uh, two of the closest brothers uh, to my heart uh, in, uh, in my entire life. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from them and preserve them, inshallah. And may Allah bless your efforts and the visionary work and leadership and the guidance of uh, Dr. Nuruddin Barakah. May we all benefit from his barakah. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And thank you again for having me. Uh, with salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm going to uh, head out just to get the uh, author while there's still time. Sakallah khairan, Sheikh Hisham. Sakallah khairan, Barakallah khairan. Salam alaikum, everybody. Inshallah, we'll see you on Saturday.